Hey everyone, welcome to this week's reading of Rune Marks with me and PD Mac. We'll be reading chapters three and four and picking right up from last week. So uh, we'll just jump right in. <clears throat> Chapter three, Gwen. <clears throat> Gwen and Amel marched wordlessly between the elven sentinels, their hands bound behind their backs with silken cord. Kirith wasn't bound, but the leader of the Sentinels kept a close eye on him. Gwen knew that they had been traveling along the border between Olivelle and Steepcross, but she hadn't expected to stumble upon a group of elven soldiers, let alone their prince. The aspect of all the elves glowed green. Gwen remembered that Eridor had said that she would get accustomed to seeing them, and he'd been right. It was there in the background, an incorporeal thing, but she didn't really notice it unless she focused on it. Amel's was blue like her own, and she unexpectedly remembered the dwarf from the attack on the outpost. His aspect had been brown. Release them, Kirith said. It was a litany from him, repeating every so often. I cannot, my lord, the lead sentinel answered, just as he had every other time. Gwen found the sentinel armor intriguing. It was enchanted with magic. That much was obvious to her. The material was constantly changing to mirror the scenery around them, cloaking the elves in perfect camouflage. Am I not the Prince of Olivelle? Kirith asked, or has my father taken that as well? You are still the Prince, my lord. Then why will you not heed my command to let them go? The leader remained silent. Blast you, Haladavar. Gwen repeated the name under her breath. It rolled off her tongue like honey. She looked at Amel. The woman had been silent since they'd been captured. She wore a scowl plastered across her face. I'm sorry I got you into this, Gwen said. Don't be, Amel replied. If I didn't want to be here, do you really think these ropes would stop me? Gwen had been wondering about that. She'd considered using her lightning against the sentinels, but since Eridor had asked her to deliver a message to someone Olivelle, she didn't think it was the best idea. Apparently, neither did Amel. Then why do you look so angry? Angry? Amel laughed. This is my normal face out in the world. It keeps people from bothering me. Silence! Hala Devar snapped, looking over her shoulder at them. Gwen glared at him, but she didn't speak another word. They trekked through the thick woodland for several hours, and Gwen could feel blisters forming on the bottoms of her feet. Her throat was dry, and all she wanted was to sit long enough for the ache in her legs to go away. She staggered a few times, almost tripping over tree roots. The air grew less humid the further they traveled, which Gwen was thankful for. The sound of civilization drew Gwen's attention, and she perked up, looking ahead for the source of the noises. Numerous trees, many of them as thick as buildings, towered over the rest of the forest. Elegant archways were carved into their facades, providing natural entrances to the interior of the trees. Gwen's breath caught in her throat with staggering beauty. There's nothing like it anywhere else, Emma whispered, and I've traveled to many places. Standing outside some of the trees, guards holding spears and pole arms watched everyone with an eye of suspicion. As Gwen and the others traversed the main path through the city, some of the elves looked at them distrustfully, and others outright ignored their presence. Gwen noticed the tension among the elves and wondered what had happened recently. Hala Devar led them to the largest tree Gwen had ever seen. Its trunk was wide enough to hold six carriages end to end. It rose into the sky, the canopy lost high above. Gwen stopped walking as she admired the tree. The guard behind her shoved her roughly, and she fell to her knees with a grunt. Kirith turned around and glared at the guard, then helped Gwen back up to her feet. I'm sorry, he said quietly. I will right this wrong. They continued into the massive tree, and Gwen's mind spun at the intricate details that had been carved into the walls. Stags, unicorns, and odd symbols and shapes covered every inch of space. The area they entered was a large open assembly room with two winding stairways on either side that led up to the next level. Wait here with them, Haladivar told the guards. Then he went up one of the stairways. Gwen continued to admire the beauty around her until Haladivar appeared at the top of the stairs. Bring them, his voice drifted down to them, filled with authority. The guards prodded Gwen and Amel, and the two climbed the ornate staircase. When they reached the top, Haladivar led them past an open balcony that offered a magnificent view of the forest city, then up a smaller set of stairs. An ivory throne wrapped in vines set against, sat against the back wall. The Lael, king of Oliville, sat on the throne, his hard eyes fixed on Kirith. Two guards stood at either side of the king, armed and intimidating. Gwen found their demeanor so different from Eridor's. The lamb returns to the fold, the Lael said. His eyes roamed the rest of the group, and his attention paused on Gwen and Amel. 
Then he looked questioningly at Haladivar. Why are there humans in my kingdom? These are the people we found Prince Kirith with, my lord. A fact you neglected to report moments ago. My apologies, Haladivar said, bowing his head. Forgiven, Kalal said. He looked back at Kirith. Tell me, is my fist so iron shod that you can't bear the weight of living under it? I left because you refused to see the threat that lies before us all, Kirith replied. King Torian is trying to expand his kingdom, and he will stop at nothing until he rules every inch of land. Is that so? How would you know this? Have you been to Eisenthal? No, Kirith answered. Do you see King Torian's armies at our doorstep? No, Kirith repeated. Then tell me how you know such things without signs of proof. Kirith bowed his head in defeat. Lyra has come here and poisoned the minds of our young generations. She spews lies and deceit about our neighbor with no proof. This is why she has been removed from my court. Gwen perked up at the mention of Lyra's name. That was the person that Gwen needed to deliver a message to. She glanced at Emil. The woman shook her head ever so slightly. Gwen wanted to ask the king where Lyra was, but her exhaustion took away her will. We need to find Lyra, Gwen whispered. We'll worry about that later. We have bigger problems right now. What problems? Why do these humans speak in my presence without permission? Valeo demanded. I'm sorry, Gwen said loudly. I meant no offense. And yet, like a wild dog, she continues to bay. Are these humans you saw within our borders? Are, are these the humans you saw within our borders? Possibly, Haladavar replied. We did kill some others that were armed. Trespassing in Olivelle is strictly prohibited, Valeo said. They weren't trespassing, Kira spoke up. They rescued me from the ones who captured me. A human doing a just deed? I find it difficult to believe. Phileo looked at Haladavar, who frowned. You dispel the rumors of King Torian's ill intent, yet you claim that humans are incapable of doing what is just. Do you not see your own madness? Kirith asked. The poison in his mind seeps from his mouth, Phileo said. Take the humans away. Their trial will be held in the morning. Kirith tried to protest, but Phileo shot him a glare, silencing him. One of the guards grabbed a hold of Gwen's arm roughly, snapped a thin bracelet around her wrist. The faint pulse of the magic that was always within her suddenly disappeared. She turned to Emil in shock, her eyes widening. Emil jerked away from the guard, trying to grab her, and struck a blow to the side of his face. The elf collapsed in an unconscious heap, but another took his place. Emil backstepped and lifted her right hand. Gwen winced, preparing for the flare of magic, but it never came. She opened her eyes to see Emil frozen in place. She looked around, but no one else was affected. Must I do everything myself? Phileo asked. He was standing now, his left hand held out in front of him, fingers splayed wide. The other guards hurriedly snapped several bracelets onto Emil's wrists, and then Phileo released his spell. Gwen guessed by the look on Emil's face that she was trying to use her runes, but nothing was happening. What is this? She growled. It is for your safety, as well as ours, Phileo answered. Now get them out of my sight, and take Prince Kirith as well. If he wants to wallow in the poison, let him. Haladavar motioned the other guards to follow him, and he escorted them up higher into the tree. Gwen looked back to the fallen elf, hoping Emil hadn't killed him. Just as he was leaving her line of sight, she saw him sit up. She breathed a sigh of relief, but, her, but was anxious about where they were headed. If Falau had such a dim view of humans, she assumed they were going to be taken to a nightmare of a prison. As it turned out, the prison was an extremely comfortable room with an open view of the forest city. Gwen looked around, assuming that the room must be for Kirith. Since he was a prince, he'd be well taken care of. Yet as Haladavar left them all, th all three of them inside, she was glad to be proven wrong. The other guards closed the doors and barred them from the outside. So these trees do have doors, Emil said. Only the personal chambers, Kirith replied. This is a guest room for visiting nobles. And your father expects us to stay here all night just to face a trial tomorrow? Gwen asked. Sadly, yes. My father is a difficult man, as you have seen. No wonder you ran away, Hamel said. She pulled at the bracelets, but they didn't budge. What are these blasted things? Those are shackles. They will keep you from leaving the boundaries of the city by force of pain. They are also cutting off my magic, Hamel huffed. How do I get them off? Yes, they do restrict magic. Only the guards can remove them. Emil growled in frustration and began pacing back and forth across the room. She reminded Gwen of a wild animal. The woman couldn't handle being caged. What is this trial your father mentioned? Gwen asked. He thinks you've trespassed into Olivelle. Our borders are closed. 
he, which makes your presence here a crime. Tomorrow morning, he'll parade you before the nobles, and they will judge whether you are innocent or not. There's a chance we'll be declared innocent? That's highly unlikely, Kirith replied. Many of the nobles share the same limited perspective as my father. They will find you guilty. What happens if they think we're guilty? You'll be executed. Gwen slumped into a nearby chair, exhausted and overwhelmed. Emil was still pacing. Kirith sat across from Gwen, his expression downcast. That was another difference she noticed among the elves. Kirith was like Eridor, letting his emotions show on his face. Thalel and the other guards seemed emotionless, their hearts hard. Your father mentioned someone named Lyra. Do you know her? Yes, Kirith replied. She is a voice of reason among my people. Lyra has opened my eyes to the threat that Torian poses. I have a message for her from a friend. Gwen didn't necessarily consider Eridor a friend, but she wasn't sure what else to call him. Her leader? That didn't sound right either. My father banished her from the court, Kirith said. What does that mean? She's not permitted inside this tree, but she is allowed to stay in the city. Do you know where to find her? Emil asked, walking over to join them. There are a few places she could be, but what does it matter? It matters because we're going to sneak out of here. How do you propose that? Kirith asked. You have no magic, and my father has guards at the door. We're not going out of the door, Emil replied. She looked away, and Gwen followed her gaze to the open balcony. We're going out that way. Chapter 4. Connell. <clears throat> Oscon was tied to a chair when they entered the room, one eye swollen, surrounded by a purple bruise. Dried blood edged the corner of his lips. What happened? Connell asked, amused at the change in the man's fortune. He was being uncooperative, Brunette replied with an unemotional shrug. Oscon bent his head up to glare at him. You're wasting my time. I got nothing to say to you. Yes, Galadir blithely replied. We know. That's why we're going to let Connell torture you. He handed a set of iron pliers to Connell. Connell looked over at Torgrith, furrowing his brow. How did that go again? We cut off his fingers, then his toes, peel his eyelids off, then cut out his tongue? Uh, yeah, something like that, Torgrith grinned at Oscon. This is going to be fun. You're not going to enjoy it, but we will. You're bluffing, Oscon snarled before turning his venom at Connell. I should have dumped you long ago. You were nothing but a dead weight. Good for nothing. That's why I got rid of you. Connell stood before him, pliers in hand. That's the best you got? Let's see if you sing the same tune. He pulled up his sleeve to reveal the brand. Recognize that? Oscon's defiance wavered. What the hell? You're a cobra? You've got eyes. What does it look like? But when did that happen? I've been one all along, Connell lied. You think I didn't know you were working for Caldir? That you were also sending reports back to Havengard? Why do you think I joined your band of fools? Because I was so impressed with your leadership? He barked a derisive laugh. Please. You gonna talk him to death? Torgrith interrupted. Or are we gonna get to torturing? Yeah, you're right. Connell said with a smile, squeezing the pliers several times. The one thing I couldn't discover before my untimely departure was who your contact was. Let's start with the fingernails. He grabbed Oscon's hand and pried a finger back, jamming the pliers against their fingertip and clamping down the fingernail. Wait a minute, Brack intervened. If you're going to torture him, what's the incentive for him to tell you anything? Connell frowned, pondered the question, then shrugged. I was more curious than anything else. I didn't think he'd tell us, just thought I'd ask before we began. Well, suppose he agrees to tell us what we need We need to know, Brack ventured. Do we need to torture him? You mean not torture him if he tells us what we need to know? Connell stared at him like he was spoiling all his fun. That was the general idea. Connell shifted a look to Oscon, then back to Brioc. How do we know he's telling the truth? We don't. Now, what does it matter what he says? Let's just get on with it. He started tugging on the fingernail. Wonder which hurts more, just yanking it out or tugging it slowly? It ain't last long if you tug it slowly, Torgoth observed. Oscon tensed, struggling to disengage his finger from Connell's vice grip. Sweat gripped on his temple and his forehead. Before you rip that out, Brian pointed out, we still haven't determined where he got the dagger. Oh, that's right. I didn't ask. 
I did ask, didn't I? Still, like I said, what does it matter? But just to humor you, I'll play along. Connell relaxed the pressure just a bit, then started tugging again, locking his gaze at Oscott. You want to tell us where about the dagger? He talked about her. Blaine gave it to me, he bellowed. Blaine? As in Brody's son, Blaine? Yes, yes, he gave it to me. Where did he get it? I don't know. I swear it. I don't know. <clears throat> really? Connell tugged harder. Oh, God, I swear. Was Brody your contact? Yes, yes. He's lying, Torgus sneered. Yank it out. Oh, God, oh, God, please. I swear it's the truth. Connell slid a glance at Galadier, who dipped his head in a quick nod. The door opened and a man slipped in, pretending to whisper something in Galadier's ear. We'll need to continue this later, Galadier announced. Without a word, they slipped out of the room, leaving Oscon sweating and breathing heavily, his imagination rampant with anticipated pain. Back in Galadier's room, Connell chuckled. That was easier than I expected. For someone who's supposed to be so tough, I barely tugged on his fingernail and he started whining like a little girl. You all played your parts very well, Galadier smiled. Well, what do we want to do with him? Brad questioned. We can't release him and we can't leave him here. Galadier saw Connell's overt look at the dagger. I don't think that's a good idea. What? Remember your experience with it? You afraid I can't control myself? Connell folded his arms across his chest. Yes. Galadier placed the dagger on the book and book stand, his hands resting on top. If that belongs to the king by rights, isn't it mine? You're not a king, Briac calmly reminded him. You're the son of a king. Huh? Torgret burst. Realizing his indiscretion, Briac heaved a sigh of irritation at himself. Huh? You might as well know. Connell is King Cameron's son. So it is true, Galadier intoned. You saw for yourself when he handled the blade. Instead of rejoicing, Galadier's face tightened. Clasping his hands behind him, he stepped away to begin pacing slowly. He will need protection. Is this a joke? Uh, another game? Torgreth demanded. It is no joke, Torgreth Iron Hand, Galadier, Galadier solemnly replied. Our friend here is a son of King Cameron. How is that even possible? Torgreth argued. He was a highwayman, and before that, lived in some town on the coast. He cast a suspicious eye at Connell. It's a surprise to me, too, Connell shrugged but I'm coming to terms with it. Torgress swung his hand in a deep sweeping bow. My liege. Well, very funny, Connell deadpanned. Torgress tilted his head to stare at him. Aren't you the same guy who jumped out the window and into the river to escape from Drewston? You have to admit it was a good dive, Connell pointed out. Torgress smiled and looked up at Galadier. You wouldn't lie to a dwarf, would you? Galadier. Galadier smiled despite himself. No, I wouldn't lie to you. It is true. Can we get back to the issue at hand? Briac chided. We need to get to Denhelm, and we can't take Oscon with us. Why not? Torgoth asked. Because they'll only slow us down. And they're probably already looking for him, Connell added before rethinking the problem. But the longer he stays away, the more likely someone else will take charge which means his position with his band of followers will have been compromised. A smile curled the corners of his lips. The longer we can keep him away, the less necessary he becomes, which means my former companions will not want to spend their time looking for us. He shifted his gaze to Galadier. Is Brunette coming with us? No, your idea is merit. We'll do as you suggested. Briac narrowed his gaze at Torgreth. No one else is to know of Connell's true identity, not even your brother. I can keep his secret, Torgreth emphatically stated, giving Connell a look that said he was still unsure he wasn't being played. We need to leave, Galadier warned. Rumors abound that all is not well in Tirmanach. We need to head for, Ten for Denhelm and Lord Farrell. As soon as I explained our plan to Brunet, it was early afternoon when they slipped out of the alleyway door and headed to the city gates, stopping by a stable to collect their mounts. I'm sure no one will notice us, Connell Riley observed, making his way through the crowded streets. A dwarf, an elf, and two men, 
just your everyday group of friends. There's nothing we can do about it, Greg said. Keep watch for any trouble. Greg led the way, Connell beside him, Galadier and Torgrith behind. Torgrith receiving the most stares. Initially smiling at the overt staring, Torgrith quickly tired of pretending and replaced his smile with a scowl. North, northwest, Connell quietly warned. I recognize the woman. She's one of Oscon's band. Their eyes met and Connell gave her a smile of recognition, causing surprise and momentary confusion. Abruptly, she melted into the swarms of pedestrians. She's gone to spread the word about me. We need to hurry. Slow down, Griot countered, reaching for Connell's reins. We don't need to draw more attention to ourselves. Finally clearing the city gates, Breck ordered, let's pick up the pace now, and spurred his horse to a trot. Don't forget about me, Torbeth complained, his pony's rhythm more of a canter than a trot. She's a strong mare, Galadier informed him, and can keep this pace for hours. Not sure I can, Torbeth grumbled, struggling to get comfortable in the saddle. A half a mile outside the gate, they crossed the intersection of the road leading north towards Irve and south towards Moncret. Connell looked back over his shoulder. They're coming, he explained. Nearly 20 riders spilled through the city case and gave chase. Urging their steeds to a gallop, they knew they could not keep this pace for long. And despite Torgus' doughty steed, the little pony could not keep pace. Accepting that they could not outrun their pursuers, Brack slowed their pace to a halt and turned to face the approaching riders, who quickly caught up and surrounded them. A tall, well-built man with a full rust-colored beard stepped his horse forward. Leaning forward, he gave Connell a condescending smile. Hello, Connell. Hello, Maldwick, he said with an indulgent grin. Connell scanned the group. Sort of makes it hard to keep it a secret when you're all that you're all highwaymen when you're so obvious. Which genius thought it was a good idea to ride out altogether? Maldwick's smug smile wavered as he suddenly realized not only had he compromised the band, but when Oscon found out, his life wasn't worth a copper royal. We came to rescue Oscon, he awkwardly said. Oscon's absence painfully obvious. Connell snorted a laugh. Let me see if I understand you correctly. You compromised everyone in the company because you wanted to rescue Oscon. In exaggerated turns of his head, he looked to his left, then right. As you can see, he's not here. Further, wasn't it Oscon himself who said that anyone left behind is on his own? Didn't Oscon say that no one is more important than the company? He's right, Maldwick, a female voice spoke up. Seems to me, Connell pointed out, that if Oscon is on his own, he's no longer the boss anymore. That means someone else has to take his place. Maldwick's face brightened until Connell added, isn't Justin next in command? He ain't here, a male voice said. Connell cocked his head to the side and now his gaze at Maldwick. I guess that means you're the boss now. Momentarily startled at the elevation, Maldwick sat up straight, assuming the role of one command. You're right, I am the boss now. Well, boss, Connell smiled. What are your plans? Are you going to sit out here where everyone can see you? Or are you going to fade away and regroup? We're going to regroup, he replied. Why don't you go with us? I can use a good man like you. Much as I'd like to, Connell replied with a faint sigh. I'm committed to another venture. Perhaps you might like to join us. What are you doing? We're going to Lord Farrell's to enlist his aid to fight King Torian. Heavy silence reigned for a moment before Maldwick laughed. You're a funny one. What are you really doing? It's true, Gallagher spoke up. We seek alliances to fight against an evil king who, if he has not stopped, will one day rule this very kingdom. An elf, Maldwick observed, curling a lip. And a half druid, Connell said, pointing to Briac. And a dwarf, Torgut chimed in. There's a visible reaction to the revelation that Connell traveled with a half druid. You travel with interesting companions, Maldwick said, regarding Connell's friends with wary eye. So do you, Connell smiled. I ask again, will you join us? What's in it for us? Everlasting fame and glory, Connell grandly answered. Maldwick sniffed a derisive laugh. Fame and glory don't put food in your belly. If that's all you seek, then I can promise that you will have plenty of food. 
Her wasting time, a female voice that scolded. Connell turned his head to see the speaker. A pretty woman with thick blonde hair held back with a leather ringlet. You're right, Becca. We are wasting time. Addressing Maldwick, he said, if you're not coming with us, then let us be on our way. Maldwick frowned and slowly shook his head. Can't do that. Why not? Your friends have seen us. They can be trusted, Connell about, says you. You're making a huge mistake. You're the one making a mistake, Maldwick countered. Before he could command his company to attack, Connell spoke up. I challenge you. What? I challenge you. By all rights, I'm still part of the company. Because I was captured doesn't change the fact that I'm still one of you. Even when they tortured me and tried to make me reveal names, I never said a word. Connell was on a roll and his story took on exaggerated proportions. Even when Oscon set me up, I never said anything. When I was betrayed by my own boss, I never said a word against him or any of you. He fixed Maldwick with a sharp eye. I'm still a member of this company. By the rules established, I challenge you. Maldwick's initial irritation faded when he sized up his opponent, was at least half a head shorter. You want to challenge me? Yes. Connell dismounted, handed the reins to Torgriff, and stepped into the clearing space in front of Maldwick. Suit yourself. Your funeral. Maldwick slid down from his salad, sat from his saddle handing the reins to the rider next to him. The challenge ends when the first person yields and the others declare the winner. I know the rules, Maldwick sneered, standing two paces away. I don't have a sword, so it's barehanded. That's fine. He unhooked his sword and handed it to the opposite rider next to him. You ready? Anytime you are, Maldwick boasted. Kind of stuck out of hand. Let's shake hands before we begin. Maldwick cocked an eyebrow. Why? No hard feelings, that's all. Immediately recognizing that he could avoid a fight simply by squeezing Connell's hand so hard that he would beg for mercy, Maldwick grasped the author's hand. A battle of strength commenced and Maldwick was shocked by the young man's grip. The cheers for Maldwick quickly diminished as the man began sweating, pouring out all the strength he could muster. His frustration surging for Connell seemed far too relaxed. Maldwin, Maldwick's knees started to tremble, then buckle as his companions watched in stunned silence. Excruciating pain pulsed from his arm and his face and body tightened in anguish. Yet still he gripped Connell's hand, except it was Connell who gripped his hand, for try as he might, he could not reciprocate the power of Connell's strength. And then he could take no more as he felt the bones grinding against each other, the pain racking his entire body. Crying out, I yield, he dropped to his knees, cradling his limp hand, gasping in heavy breaths. Tilting his head to stare up at him, his mouth gaped open. Who, who are you? <clears throat> I'm Connell, the new boss of this company. He bent down to help lift him to standing. Turning to the rest of the highwaymen, he said, does anyone wish to challenge me? None responded, more than a few looking at him with awe. Swinging back up into the saddle, he waited as Maldick struggled to pull himself up into his saddle, then addressed the company. Maldick remained second in command. Obey him as you would me, for eventually he will become boss. Surprise, Maldwick respectfully dipped his head. We ride for Danhelm. As of this moment, you are no longer highwaymen, but respected members of an elite group. Thinking this a new hustle, they grinned and smirked. Deciding it would be more trouble, trouble to tell him the truth, he returned their smiles. Wait till they find out I'm a cobra. All right. That wraps it up for this week. So uh, if you haven't subscribed, make sure you hit the subscribe button so you uh, get the updates for when we put up new videos and any other videos I put up on my channel. And uh, as always, pleasure to have you, PD Mac. So we will call it a, call it a night. See ya. <laughs>